All right, we're live. Um, I was going to minimize this. All right, everybody, we're live with uh, Dr. Michael Perry, um, Chair of Infectious Diseases at Stanford Health. And we're just going to wait a couple of minutes for folks to log on. And then we'll hear from Dr. Perry. How's everybody doing out there? So Dr. Perry right now, um, we're live on Facebook and, and a couple people are watching us, but it's on a, about a 20 second delay. So um, I turned down the sound on that so it doesn't interfere with us, um, but people will be able to submit the comments that way. My little picture on the top says mute. Uh, you you're, can... you're coming through to me. Okay. I'm sure people will let us know if there are any issues. Hey everybody, let us know if you can hear us okay. Hey everybody, we're gonna get started in just a minute or two. Uh, this is my first foray with the Zoom to Facebook Live adventure. So hopefully uh, this will go off without a hitch and let me know if you're having any trouble hearing us or seeing us as we move forward. Okay, so my mother's watching us, no pressure. She says we look good. <laughs> Hope we sound good too. Yeah, that's the important part. I'm sure you will. <laughs> I hope so. All right, as some folks um, may have noted already, the big backlog with the Department of Labor's processing of unemployment insurance claims has somewhat progressed. Um, they've gotten through about 80% of their claims. So for those of you who are who have been waiting on those claims to come through, um, you should be hearing about those shortly. And again, if you don't, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me, whether through Facebook or my email, um, and we'll be sure to check in on them. All right, I think we'll get started. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Representative Matt Blumenthal. I'm here today with Dr. Michael Perry, the Thomas J. Bradsell Chair of Infectious Diseases at Stanford Health. Uh, and Dr. Perry is going to give us an update on the progress of COVID-19 in the Stanford area and our response as a city and uh, Stanford Health's response. 
uh, and he's been kind enough to be here to answer some of our questions. Uh, Dr. Perry is a graduate of the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. He did his residency, uh, was in residency at Columbia and one at the University of California, San Francisco, and he did a fellowship as well at Columbia. And he's board certified in both infectious disease, which is uh, the primary reason that he's here with us today, and uh, internal medicine as well. And as I said before, he's the chair of infectious diseases um, here at Stanford Health. So he's been very focused on this pandemic since uh, even before it hit our shores here in the US. And we've been speaking with him uh, previously about Stanford's response. Uh, in addition to all his uh, medical qualifications, which are many, um, you may have also seen Dr. Perry around. Uh, he's been very active along with his wife, Patricia, in uh, veterans issues and uh, properly remembering and uh, supporting veterans here in the Stanford area. Uh, he's a member of a Gold Star family, uh, stepfather of Chief Petty Officer Brian Bill, a Navy SEAL who was killed in action in Afghanistan. And uh, Dr. Perry and Patricia have uh, done a really tremendous job of preserving his memory through the Brian Bill Foundation and through all their veterans related activities. Uh, so you've probably seen him around the city on that, but you may not have known how essential his medical professional experience and knowledge was gonna be in this moment. So we're so glad to have him here today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Perry, uh, for being with us. And uh, whenever you're ready, you can give us uh, an update on uh, where we're at so far in this COVID-19 pandemic and response in Stanford. Thanks, Matt. Uh, thanks for those kind remarks. Hello, everybody. So we've been following the pandemic, which wasn't a pandemic in January, but certainly became a pandemic very quickly uh, for the last three months. And it seems like three years. It's an incredibly uh, uh, expanding problem. And when we look at the number of cases worldwide, which is now over 2.5 million, uh, the growth of number of cases continues to rise on a daily basis, uh, both globally and in the US. The US is now the leading COVID country in the world, a dubious distinction, uh, with uh, about 825,000 cases and about 50,000 deaths. Um, it continues to uh, spread throughout the country, but um, in the tri-state area here, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, there is some sign that that rise is slowing. And in some areas, in fact, even in Fairfield County, uh, there's some evidence that we've reached a plateau in the number of cases. We still are very busy. That plateau doesn't mean that it's going away. It just means that the number of daily cases that we see, the number of people in our ICU and in our med surge floors is pretty constant and flat. So our admissions and discharge is pretty well matched at the moment. We have become an, a, a, an ICU hospital. Uh, Stanford Hospital used to run a census of about 220 of which at this time of year, 12 or 14 might be intensive care patients. But we've expanded our ICU to 62 beds from a maximum previously of 20. That means we've had to create new ICU areas within the hospital. Uh, those ICU beds have been pretty full, although now the, uh, the census is a little bit less than it was. Um, we normally at this time of year would uh, run five or six patients on ventilators, and now we have 30 or more patients on ventilators. And it's all COVID-19. About half the hospital is COVID patients. And the other half is the usual medical surgical cases. Although the surgical cases are less because we've been uh, uh, deferring pretty much all the elective surgery, doing just emergency surgeries or urgent surgeries uh, as the case may be because of our our commitment to taking care of the uh, COVID patients. Um, in terms of the uh, management of these patients, I think it's worthwhile touching a little bit on treatment because there's been a lot in the press about that. Uh, 
most of the treatment continues to be supportive. This is a viral infection that affects the lungs primarily. So patients usually present with cough, shortness of breath, fever. And the primary need that the patients have is oxygen. The virus affects the lungs and fills the lungs up with fluid and patients can't breathe. Um, and so that's why the need for ventilators. Uh, that's why the need for high levels of oxygen. And that is the mainstay of therapy. Fluids, nutrition, oxygen, and respiratory support. The medical drug treatment therapy does not really exist at this point with a couple of exceptions. The early enthusiasm for hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin um, has really not borne out. Uh, there have been new randomized trials comparing those drugs to placebo, and there really is no difference. In fact, uh, those drugs do have some side effects and the outcomes uh, have not been any better with those compounds. Uh, there are some experimental antiviral drugs uh, which are available, which uh, are being used in clinical trials, uh, but even those are not very optimistic. So it remains this, the support of the patient when the, and the delivery of oxygen. A couple of things do look promising. One of them is convalescent plasma. So patients who recover from COVID-19 develop antibodies. And those antibodies help them to recover. By donating plasma or blood that contains those antibodies uh, and then transfusing those antibodies into patients who are very sick in the hospital, uh, there seems to be some improvement in those patients. They're getting antibodies from others who've recovered. And that therapy, which has a long medical history for other diseases, uh, seems to be helping. Uh, a lot of information is still out on that therapy, but that does seem to be valuable. There are some other antivirals in, in clinical trials, which may be helpful also, but that's really the limit of, of treatment. Patients who come in the hospital with uh, COVID-19 uh, because of their pneumonia are usually in the hospital for a long time. It takes two to three weeks to recover from this with or without a ventilator. And a lot of patients don't need ventilators. Um, and they can be supported with just high, what we call high flow oxygen. So that's what we're seeing in, in the hospital setting. It's important though to say that 80% of patients have a relatively mild illness which is fortunate that they don't need to be in the hospital. They don't need treatment. They recover with time. And of those 80%, there's a certain number that actually have no symptoms or very few symptoms. And there's a very strange body of literature which looks at the asymptomatic patient, the patient who has no symptoms yet is infected. And different studies show that's as few as 3% of the total to as many as 60% of the total. Obviously those are not reconcilable numbers. It probably uh, lies somewhere in between, but I think it's important for the public to realize that although many patients, particularly people with comorbidities or over age 70 uh, require hospitalization and, and may not do well, the vast majority have a relatively mild illness and some people are just completely asymptomatic. You know, we would hope with all of the global spread in the 2.5 million cases, particularly in Europe and now in the US, that there would be lots of immune people walking around in the community. And that would be important because until you get a large percentage of the population being immune, this infection is going to continue to spread. And we call that herd immunity. And in many uh, viral infections, that's produced by vaccination. Unfortunately, we don't have a vaccine for COVID-19. So we would rely on increasing numbers of infections in the community, making increasing numbers of the population immune. But surveys, mostly in Europe at this point, show that the level of immunity in the population is only about 5%, despite all these infections. And 5% is not anywhere near enough to develop what we would call herd immunity. So the population is relatively resistant to this infection. So 
uh, that unfortunately leaves us a big gap between 5% and what we might need for herd immunity somewhere in the range of 50%. So I think we're going to have to rely on the development of new drugs, the development of medications which perhaps can be used in an outpatient setting to prevent hospitalization, and ultimately a vaccine to get on top of this pandemic. In the meantime, I think we're going to have to de deal with some degree of social distancing and wearing masks and being more careful uh, than we've been in the past. Um, doing that for COVID-19 has done a very other, a very interesting thing. We follow other viral infections during the season. Uh, it's been an interest of mine and we see nothing else. So the hand washing and the social distancing and the wearing masks in public has eliminated almost all other viral infections, respiratory infections. There's no flu, there's no other virus around. It's all COVID-19 right now. That's obviously a more difficult virus because it's more contagious um, and there's no immunity in the population at all unless you've actually had it. So that's the dilemma. That's basically where we are. Stanford Health has expanded its, uh, its, uh, its role in the community. We've been doing a lot of testing. Uh, we have increased the size of our hospital actually by opening up the old hospital uh, to create units of 30, currently 32 extra beds to allow us to take care of the large number of cases that we've seen. Uh, fortunately, we've had lots of discharges, which is a good thing. Patients are getting better and going home. Although those that actually end up on a ventilator, if they're over 80 years of age and have diabetes and other diseases, um, they unfortunately uh, don't always make it. Uh, but um, the vast majority do. And again, the vast majority actually don't end up in the hospital, even though they may be quite sick. So that's sort of where we are in a nutshell. Um, uh, Stanford Hospital, unfortunately, has the most cases in the state of Connecticut. Um, some other areas of the state are still on the upswing, and so that will probably level out over time. Uh, but we are still in a very active pattern of social distancing, mask wearing, uh, hand hygiene, and I think that needs to be our new mindset as we go forward over the next several months. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Perry, for that uh, very fulsome and concise uh, introduction. It's a lot of really great information. Um, and uh, I just wanted to also say a thank you to you and Stanford Health and everyone, you and all your colleagues and uh, everyone you're working with for everything you're doing. Uh, Stanford Health has been uh, very fast reacting and has had a plan for everything. And it's just been amazing to watch how you guys have uh, confronted the virus as it's, as it's come to Stanford. Um, so I know that that's uh, a significant part due to your work, but also uh, those you work with. So thank you uh, to all of you for everything you're doing to keep our community safe. Yeah, it's a big team and a lot of frontline workers uh, putting in long hours and, uh, and taking some risks, but uh, we try to protect our workers the best we can, although personal protective equipment like gowns and masks and face shields and gloves uh, have been hard to come by. Uh, it's yeah. been a bit of a struggle, but uh, we keep on every day looking at days on hand for all these, uh, all these pieces of equipment and uh, we've, we've managed so far. All right, so um, now uh, we've reached the period we really wanted to get to here, which is the fact that you can ask some questions of Dr. Perry. Um, you can write them in the comments and I will kind of cycle through them. I'm gonna ask a couple of kind of low-hanging fruit questions first um, of Dr. Perry, which I know a number of people probably have. Um, and also if you have questions uh, that are more addressed to the state reaction and not as directed as the public, at the public health response and situation, I'm gonna, wait on answering those until uh, Dr. Perry has had uh, an opportunity to receive as many questions as possible because his time is so valuable. So um, first, I just wanted to kind of ask you, um, have we seen that social distancing is working and kind of flattening the curve here? Um, and um, 
I guess part two is um, you you've mentioned we'll continue to need to continue social distancing, but um, if you could just uh, describe how and if you've seen it working in our area and what role you're going to we're going to see it playing going forward. Well, I think it's about all we've been able to do really is social distancing, uh, hand hygiene, wearing masks and being careful. And uh, that's about the only intervention that the community has done so far. And the curve is flattening out. Um, I think that uh, the other interventions uh, in terms of medication um, have not been there. Uh, different than most other uh, conditions, even influenza, where we have medications and vaccines that can bring to bear some kind of moderation of the, of the outbreak every year. So the curve is flattening, and I think it's a, a tribute to the kind of interventions like social distancing uh, that we have done. It's uh, a, a tribute to the um, the, the medical care that we provided for the patients, but as I said, much of this is outpatient management, which is purely quarantine, social distancing, and uh, and mask wearing, and so that's the intervention. And hopefully, the curve will continue to flatten out and then gradually fall. The only downside of that is that there aren't enough infections to generate immunity in the population. And of course, there's a, there's a trade-off. Um, and at some point, obviously, the consequences of social distancing and isolation and quarantine uh, include things like job loss and, uh, and depression. And there's got to be a balance at some point between you know, social needs, personal needs, health conditions in the community uh, that drives the strategy. Uh, and so I, I think we're, we, we want to talk about opening up and in certain areas, we need to do that as safely as we can do it and monitor what happens. Because this is all a new field for all of us. We've never been in a situation like this, although the 1918 flu pandemic was probably uh, very close. Um, and uh, do you know off? The, this is kind of specific, but um, do you know off the top of your head what the rates of hospitalizations have been like at Stanford Hospital over the past week or so? Have they been? I guess um, you, they've been leveling off and flattening out. But do you know kind of what the range is in terms of numbers? In terms of numbers, I have, I, I'm not exactly sure what the precise numbers are, but we're we on the order of uh, eight to 10 admissions a day. Uh, and it does fluctuate. Uh, and that's balanced on the other end by discharges as we've sort of plateaued and reached a, 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 a happy medium as, as, uh, as I guess you could say. We were running about 150 inpatients with COVID-19 about two weeks ago. This morning, I think it was 125. That was our inpatient census with COVID-19. And it goes up and down a little bit from day to day. But the trend over the last two to three weeks has been downward by about 10 or 15 percent. OK, that's good to hear. Um, so I have a couple questions about how transmissible the disease is. Um, questions about whether people can check their mail and whether people who have recovered can still be carriers. Could you address? Uh, uh, the transmissibility. Right. So this is primarily in the community droplet spread, right? This is coughed, sneezed, uh, spoken, uh, breathed. Uh, those droplets come out of your mouth. And generally in the community setting, this is large droplets. And that's why we say six feet of distance is relatively safe because those droplets don't travel and they're not suspended in the air for any significant portion of the time in the community setting. That's why social distancing, wearing a mask and washing your hands to prevent the hand to mouth to nose carriage of virus. Because viruses like, like the coronaviruses do live on surfaces. Their duration on surfaces is not indefinite and it's very easily cleaned. It's not resistant to the usual disinfectants, but 
if those surfaces are not cleaned, uh, you can pick up the virus on your hands and then inoculate yourself. And we think that with for these respiratory illnesses like influenza, coronavirus, and others, that that's the main mode of transmission. So a surface that somebody else has touched is probably a potential source. Now, things like groceries and mail, for the most part, are not high risk. And uh, what is high risk are things like doorknobs and handrails and desktops and computer keyboards, and things that lots of people use without cleaning. Uh, and so we need to make efforts and we try to do that, particularly in the healthcare environment, to clean those surfaces regularly so that there's not transfer of viruses and bacteria from hand to surface to somebody else's hands. So I think that's sort of a summary. Uh, we don't clean down the grocery bags. Um, we do, you know, basic hand hygiene, which is important, and uh, uh, and wearing a mask when we're thrust into a uh, an area that's crowded outside. Uh, so far, uh, that has worked for most people. In the hospital setting, obviously, there's a lot more exposure because those are patients who are sick, lots of virus, coughing. Um, in taking care of these patients, you're forced to be close to them. Um, we wear masks, we wear face shields, we wear gowns, we wear gloves to protect ourselves. And in fact, we've looked at our staff, particularly those staff that take care of the very, very sick COVID infected patients, and we have very, very few infections in our properly protected staff, which is very encouraging to me in terms of the strategy of keeping our employees healthy and safe, because obviously that's our, our largest treasure and we, we have to pay a lot of attention to that and we do. So it sounds like uh, the very short version is, as long as you're mitigating the risk by proper hand hygiene, don't touch your eyes and face, et cetera, uh, that, you know, getting your mail, you know, being, you know, touching objects like that is not as big a concern. You can do that, but proper hand hygiene is key. You know, all sorts of objects can carry the virus, but what we're really concerned about is those person-to-person -person interactions where the droplets can be exchanged, and that's the reason for the social distancing and masks. Right, and if you handle something that you know has been handled by other people, then just you need to wash your hands after you're done. And if you don't have soap and water, the alcohol-based hand sanitizers are very effective. The coronavirus is not resistant to the alcohol in, the, in these products, and they're very useful, and you don't need soap, and you don't need water. And you can do it when you're in the car, you can do it when you're in the grocery store. Uh, it's good to have that handy. All right, great. Um, so there's some questions about testing. So uh, if you could talk a bit about uh, where we're at with testing and capacity, uh, and if there are any indications about uh, what that's going to look like going forward. That's great. Yes, yeah, I'm happy to talk about testing. We've come a long way from where we were a month ago when the testing that was available um, took a, a week to come back and results were not timely and therefore you couldn't make clinical decisions in a timely fashion. Uh, we're in a good shape right now at Stanford Hospital. I think it's important for people to understand that there are two different kinds of tests. One is a test for the virus. It's actually a test for the RNA of the virus. It's called a PCR test. And that's the rapid point of care test that you've heard about, the Abbott test, uh, which is a test for the virus looking at a method called PCR. And that test requires a swab that's taken from the throat or the nasopharynx in the back of the nose. And that's processed uh, through a very sophisticated molecular method called a PCR that gives you an answer in 15 to 30 minutes to an hour, depending upon the manufacturer of the kit you're using. Those tests are very specific. So if it's positive, it's positive. And we're very uh, convinced that that's a reliable test for positivity. Unfortunately, they may not be very sensitive. And we think that there's a 10 to 15% false negative rate, which is a lack of sensitivity of these tests. And some of that is based upon a, an adequate sample, getting a really good sample from the back of the throat or the back of the nose, 
a simple swab in the front of the nose or in the mouth is likely to give you a, a negative test. Well, that's part of the reason for these false negative tests. Some of the kits on some of these tests are not quite as robust as others. And so the, the actual test may not be as sensitive. And that certainly is a concern that we have. And then patients don't always have lots of virus in their secretions, particularly if they've been sick for a week. They may have low quantities of virus. And although they're actually infected with the coronavirus, the virus amounts are below the limits of sensitivity of the test. So the three real reasons for the lack of, of sensitivity and the false negatives that we see. A positive is a reliable positive. A negative is probably negative, but might not be because you might have that false negative test. The other type of test is called an antibody test. And this is for the most part a blood test looking for the proteins that the body generates in response to infection. The way you get better from an infection is you, your body uh, makes proteins that are called antibodies that fight the infection. Whether it's the flu or coronavirus or a strep infection, your body makes antibodies that helps you fight the infection. And as you recover from the infection, those antibodies can be measured in the blood. And these antibody tests measure those antibodies and tell us that you are getting better, recovering, that you've had the infection. If you come to me on the first day of infection, uh, that test is going to be negative. It only develops with time. So the antibody tests are useful to tell us who's been infected, who is recovering from infection, uh, maybe who was infected a week ago or two weeks ago or three weeks ago, or who was infected a year ago. And most of the tests that are available now wouldn't distinguish between a week ago and a year ago. So these, these tests are not really the good test to use for diagnosing an acute infection, but can tell us in retrospect that you were infected. And this may be important in certain populations like our hospital employees. We'd kind of like to know if they'd been infected and were now relatively resistant. I won't say immune because this, these tests are not really validated for that. But they would tell us like 5% of the population's been infected or you know, 10% of a nursing home has been infected or 20% of our physicians in the emergency room have been infected. And that gives us a sense of risk and a sense of uh, the, the, the potential immunity in a population. Uh, so those are the two kinds of tests. Both are pretty widely available at this point. And we have both of those at Stanford Hospital uh, testing patients and our staff uh, and patients both in coming into the hospital and in the community. That's great to hear. And it sounds like um, in terms of the, oh, so in terms, one of the questions we've gotten is, um, so if you have contracted but recovered from the virus, do we know yet whether you're immune to it going forward? We don't know the answer to that question. We can infer that from other coronavirus infections like SARS and MERS, which is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, uh, which is still ongoing in the Middle East, that immunity does develop after infection, but it may not be long lived. So that immunity may last for six to 12 months to a year or two in some people, but is variable from person to person. Some people develop good antibodies, some people develop antibodies that aren't really effective in producing long-lasting immunity. Even though the blood tests may be positive, those antibodies may not be the ones that you need to have for long-lasting immunity, even though they may be a marker of having had the infection. So the short answer is we don't know yet. Um, and uh, another question we've gotten uh, in the comments has been, uh, what are the trends in terms of hospitalizations and uh, the course uh, of disease in terms of gender, blood type, age, comorbidity? Um, could you discuss that a little bit? Uh, 
first. Yeah, it's mainly an issue of age and comorbidities, but comorbidities are the, I think, the overriding risk factor. Um, age and comorbidities, of course, frequently go together. People who are 70 and 80 years of age tend to have diabetes and heart disease. And um, those are obviously not independent risk factors. Uh, obesity is another risk factor. Underlying respiratory disease like asthma and chronic lung disease, they're all risk factors. And of course, they're all more frequent with, with age. And so the two kind of go together. The, the, the worst outcomes are in patients over age 80 who end up on a ventilator. And the New York data suggests that only 10 to 15% of those patients will actually survive. So in that setting where you've got a lot of comorbidities, you're, you're over age 80 and you need a ventilator to get by, uh, those outcomes are, are not good. But that's a small percentage of, of the total. And another question we've gotten is, uh, have you seen any trends in terms of uh, COVID infections being accompanied by uh, or leading to blood clots or strokes or anything like that? Yeah, there are some other interesting features of this which are problematic. I think we've learned as we've gone along. One of them is, as you allude to, the what we call coagulopathy, the tendency to form blood clots. Uh, that certainly has become something that we have realized over the last month or two, and we've actually changed our approach to treatment so that we do anticoagulate patients who are in the hospital with COVID-19, and they, uh, we, we, we give moderately good-sized doses of blood thinner to try to prevent this complication. The other thing we've noted is the kidney prob kidney failure is not uncommon in patients who come in with uh, COVID-19 infections. And we've learned to be a little bit more judicious in terms of fluid management to minimize the risk of, uh, of this uh, complication. We also realize that heart problems are sometimes seen in COVID-19, particularly late in the illness, maybe on week two or three, heart failure can become a problem. So we've sort of learned to anticipate that and, and be careful with some of our medications, which may also impact cardiac function. So all those things uh, are important and we've learned to kind of adapt and uh, adjust our protocols for management because of those things. Okay. Um, so from, I'll just note before uh, I ask this question, uh, we've gotten a good amount of time with Dr. Perry so far, so if you've got some uh, last few questions, please make sure you get them in. Um, uh, so uh, what role from kind of a public health perspective is uh, testing going to play with um, how we go forward and perhaps open up uh, once that becomes appropriate? I think testing is not going to be as helpful as we would like it to be. It's going to tell us where we are in terms of prevalence of a community experience. You know, how many people in the community have actually had it? But what's going to be more important is are the numbers of new infections that we are seeing, the rate with which people come into the hospital. As, as we see this declining and we see fewer uh, hospitalizations from COVID, fewer emergency room visits from COVID-19, fewer respirator days. I mean, these will be indications that we are in some sense controlling the pandemic and will allow us to kind of loosen up some of the restrictions that we have put in place from a public health perspective. The testing will give us a baseline sort of measure of where we are, but I don't think there's any number that's going to say it's time to go back to work or it's time to lose your masks. I don't think those testing parameters are going to be that helpful. Testing may be useful in, in, in perhaps small group settings like uh, in, in certain types of patients like cancer patients perhaps or dialysis patients. Uh, where we may be able to stratify risk and then cohort individuals based upon whether they've had it or not. Again, a nursing home might be a good example of that. 
and I know the state is looking at stratifying nursing homes uh, who've had lots of experience with COVID infections and those that haven't in order to kind of mitigate risk at a nursing home level. So all the information that we get from testing, whether it's antibodies or PCRs, helps us to kind of strategize our mitigation uh, efforts. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be the answer as to when we start to pull back from some of these public health measures. Okay. It's, so it sounds like, and I've heard this a couple other places, uh, you mentioned a couple other measures, but for people just kind of in the public, you know, just everyone who's trying to monitor how, how we're doing and, and what's going on. It sounds like uh, hospitalizations is probably the most reliable data point. Would you agree with that? I would think that uh, probably one of the important data points, yes. And within hosp overall hospitalizations, the severity, because the amount of ventilator use, um, the mortality rates, I think all those are going to be all important measures that we are following very carefully and are looking for more improvement in. Okay. Um, and let's see what else we got. Last would like question to say, or two. I'd like to say, as long as we have a, 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 a little pause, okay, go ahead. How, how much the hospital and health system appreciate the community's response. The community's response from bringing meals uh, for nursing staff, uh, giving a shout out to the hospital, um, donating masks, even making masks at home, cloth masks and, and, and donating to the hospital. I think all those gestures really go a long way to making the staff feel appreciated, uh, comfortable, and we all really uh, are very thankful for the community support. And I do wanna uh, thank the community, uh, at least those of you that are on the call uh, for all of the support, both tangible and intangible that you've given to the, to the hospital. So I say thank you. Well, uh, I know we all appreciate the work that you all have been doing and the risk uh, that you've been at. Uh, I guess, two final questions. Um, one is, um, and this may require a little bit of a longer answer, so I apologize. Um, it sounds like, uh, I, I've read some, an article in the Times, it sounds like you were alluding to this as well, that when we eventually do try to open up, it's gonna be kind of, it's probably gonna have to be kind of cautiously in fits and starts and we're gonna have to monitor hospitalizations. Is that fair to say? Yes, I think, you know, there's so some obvious thought that needs to go into what we do. Um, mm -hmm. For example, we've closed the golf courses in Stanford, right? But golf courses, at least in terms of playing a round of golf, is not a high risk event. And that would be something you could loosen up. You could say, okay, we'll open this. You, there are things that you could do that will have very small impacts. And so incrementally, I think will be the way we will open up monitoring uh, the impact of each of those changes and continuing to have some level of social distancing, focus on hand hygiene, wearing masks, being cognizant about staying home if you're sick, keeping your hands away from your nose and mouth and eyes. So I think those kind of things will be with us for a while, even as we kind of reduce some of the uh, intensity of the mitigation strategies that we've employed. Okay, and I'll put one last question to you and then we'll let you go. We've already imposed, uh, we've already run over on you. So we really appreciate your patience with us. Um, and that is just, uh, what can we in the community do to, to help right now, do you think? I think the main thing is to listen to the, uh, the public health folks uh, who have one goal and that's to, see this pandemic gradually disappear. And so being as compliant as you can with all of those things we just talked about will be the biggest contribution that you as individuals can make to the, uh, to the resolution of this problem. Uh, certainly um, the hospital appreciates all of the efforts the community has made to support the, uh, the health system. Uh, and we look forward to that continued support. But I think from a community perspective, 
it's uh, paying attention to all of the messages and the mitigation efforts that we we publicize because uh, we all have one goal and that's for this to eventually go away well i hope that everyone will take that message to heart um, let's listen to public health professionals like dr perry who are working so hard for us uh, thank you, Dr. Perry, for uh, all your work at Stanford Health. Thank you to you and all your colleagues for all you're doing. And thank you for being here with us today to answer our questions. I know people really appreciate it. Thank you, Matt, for having me. And have a good night, everybody. Thanks. Bye.